Time flies. Seems like just yesterday that some of you were freshmen, and now look at you. You made it. My wife, Felicity, and I are uh, stunned that in just a little over a month and a half, our daughter, Eliana, will be five years old. And time has just flown. I mean, people said that before we had kids. They said, oh, just you wait till you have kids. And it's like time just zooms by. And that's the way it's been. I remember how excited and nervous we were before she was born. Going from having no children to having a child, it is such a major adjustment. I remember the first time that Felicity and I walked into a Baby's R Us. How many of you have ever been to Baby's R Us? We walked in... We're, you know, expecting our first child. We're trying to get this right. Do what you're supposed to do as a good parent. So we walk into Babies R Us, and we look around, and I felt so overwhelmed. There were thousands of products, big stuff to teeny tiny little things, and I had no idea what 80% of it did. And I remember looking around at all of this, and I had two thoughts. First thought was, how much is this going to cost? Second thought was, Lord help. Lord, just help us. I felt so overwhelmed. In preparing for the sermon, I went to Baby's RS's website. And on their website, they're trying to be helpful. Uh, if you're a new parent, they're trying to help you know what you need. And so they have a must-have list of products. If you're about to become a parent, then these are products you really need to have. They have... 81 products on that list. How people survived, how they raised children for Babies R Us, I don't know. You know, I mean, evidently, probably three generations ago, they'd just have the baby and just throw it out in the pasture and just hope that it grew. But now we have Babies R Us. We've got all of these products that you must have. And they have a must-have list, and then they have the good-to-have list. On the good-to-have list, there's another 50 products. So 81 products on the must-have list, 50 products on the, on the good-to-have list. And of course, most of these products, or many of them, are related to child safety. Do you know how difficult it is to not buy a product that is geared for child safety? Because you want to protect your kids, right? You want to do the best you can. When it comes to the safety and well-being of your child, you have to think about so many things. You have to come up with ways of protecting them in the world, in your home, protecting them from, your, from themselves, protecting them from each other if you have more than one child. And we go to tremendous lengths to try to protect our kids. We install latches in drawers and cupboards so they can't open certain drawers and cupboards. We install gates in our homes to keep the little ones from falling down the stairs or from crawling up the stairs, as the case may be. We put plastic covers over electrical outlets just in case Johnny finds a fork and decides to be real creative. <laughs> we buy age-appropriate car seats with safety harnesses. When I was a child, there were no car seats. They didn't even put seat belts on us. They just threw us in the back of the car and said, good luck. And you can, and I'm not making this up. This is true. You can even buy a device that will lock down the lid of your toilet so that your toddler can't open and then explore the inside of your toilet bowl. Felicity and I decided not to buy that little piece of equipment we were wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. That's not happened yet. But what I'm getting at is this. It's the first note on the note sheet provided in the bulletins. So much of what we do for our children is about restricting their behavior for the sake of protecting them. So much of what we do for our children is about restricting their behavior for the sake of protecting them. And it's not just with little children. From toddlers to grade schoolers to teenagers, we try to set loving limits and boundaries on their behavior. 
We try to discourage bad behavior and encourage good behavior. It's called discipline. That's what we're talking about today, discipline. As the note sheet says, applying discipline is perhaps one of the greatest challenges of parenting. Can I get an amen? Applying discipline is one of the greatest challenges of parenting. Keeping a child from doing something bad when they really want to do it, that's discipline. Getting a child to do something that's good or right when they really don't want to do it. That's discipline. Saying no when the child wants to hear yes. That's discipline. Saying yes you must when the child says no I don't want to. That's discipline. Last night after we had the concert, the fundraiser here at the church for the food closet, our uh, two-year-old, you know this is by this time it's past their bedtime. We're just thinking of how can we get the kids home and, and get things, you know, get them to bed quickly. And our two-year-old, he's like, let's go to McDonald's. That's what he said. Let's go to McDonald's. Only he calls it Miss Donald's. Let's go to Miss Donald's. And we said, buddy, it's bedtime. No, we can't go to McDonald's now. And it, you just would have thought we had just reached in his little chest and pulled out his heart. He just, no, I want to go to Miss Donald's. Applying discipline can be very difficult. Because most children really don't like it. Have you noticed that? The teenager doesn't always want to be home by a certain time. The grade schooler doesn't always want to do homework, even though it's due the next day. And sometimes the toddler doesn't want to stay in that car seat. And yet, if you love them, you've got to make them do it. If you love your children, you have to apply discipline if you love them. Now, if you really don't care about them, if you really don't care what kind of people they grow up to be, then hey, just let them do whatever. But if you love them and you want to protect them and you're wanting them to become a person of a certain character, then you've got to apply discipline. Proverbs 13.24 puts it this way. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Discipline is an expression of love, or at least healthy discipline. There's bad examples too. There's good examples too, right? Healthy discipline is an expression of love. Proverbs 19.18 says this, Discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. So here, the scripture is telling us that if we fail to apply healthy, loving discipline, then it's as if we are being a party to our child's death. We are setting them up for destruction if we don't discipline them. We discipline our children because we love them. They may not like it, but it's what's best for them. Discipline. The love no one wants. That's the title of this morning's sermon. Discipline. The love no one wants. I want to share a story with you that I've shared in quite a few sermons over the years because it's a really good story. It's a true story. I was there. Back when my niece Lauren, who's now like, what is she, 12, 11, 12, Back when she was about three years old, her dad, Mark, my brother-in-law, we and Lauren, we, we went out and we did some shopping in the store. And after we finished shopping, we go out to the car. We get in the car to, to drive home. And, and uh, Mark turned to Lauren, who's sitting in the back at her, in her seat there, her, her booster seat. And he says, Lauren, put your seatbelt on. She said, no. Said Lauren, you need to put your seatbelt on. And then he, he got into the logic mode and just explained, Well, here are the reasons why, honey. We're going to be driving on the road. It's not just going to be us, there's going to be other cars too. If God forbid something bad happens, you know, it could have an accident and you can get really hurt. So you need to put that seatbelt on. She wasn't convinced. So he asked her again. She still refused. She said, I don't want to. So at this point, Mark 
reached back and put the seatbelt on for her. Click. Once Mark got back in his position behind the steering wheel, we heard unclick. <laughs> Is that a word? Unclick. And she pulled that seatbelt off her. Then he firmly commanded her to put that seatbelt on or we weren't leaving the parking lot. She didn't move. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is going to be a long trip to the store. How long is this going to take? Finally, he threatened to punish her in a big way if she didn't put that car seat on, that, that seat belt. And so finally, after a, a moment's hesitation, you heard her take that seat belt, click it in. And then all was quiet for a moment. And then in a whisper, just loud enough for us to hear, Lauren said, I wish I had a different daddy. I looked over at Mark, and bless his heart, you know, I just stole a glance and I looked over at him. He's sitting behind the steering wheel just with this defeated expression. You know, he's like, I'm trying to love this child, and she doesn't appreciate me. She hates me. She wants a different daddy. The ironic thing was that in making her put that seat belt on, Mark was doing the most loving thing for Lauren at that moment, even though she didn't understand it, even though it didn't feel like love to her. It just felt like a frustration and an inconvenience. But it was the most loving thing. It's tough. It's tough applying discipline especially when your children don't agree with it, don't understand it, don't like it. Part of the challenge of parenting is being able to discipline our children without losing their love, without making them resentful and bitter, even when you are doing the right thing. One of the most helpful things that I've learned in regard to this is something that I read years ago from a Christian author named Josh McDowell. I know some of you are familiar with him. He wrote this, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Whenever we give our children all sorts of rules with having, without having already deeply invested in our relationship with them, then they're definitely going to rebel. Josh McDowell wrote in his book, Right from wrong. He wrote, rules are best understood in the context of a relationship. For example, if I need to correct my children, I begin by asking a question that appeals to our relationship. If the answer to that question is positive, then I can be confident that they will respond to my correction. I ask, do you know that I love you? By asking that question before I offer correction, I appeal to them, not on the basis of my authority, but on the basis of our relationship. For those of you that have kids or have grandkids, what is the quality of your relationship with your child or grandchild? McDowell goes on to offer a list of questions to help reveal the depth of our relationship with our children. He, he asks, when's the last time you laughed together? When's the last time you cried together? And if you have a toddler, the answer to both those questions is yesterday. Do you know what his favorite song is currently? Do you know whom she sits with in the school cafeteria? When did she last seek your advice? Probably before she turned 13. When did you last forget or cancel a commitment you made to him? Have you recently admitted a mistake or fault of your own to her? In this one, what do you know, really know, about his or her spiritual life? Good questions, huh? But even if we really do our best to invest in our relationship with our kids, with our grandkids, that's no guarantee that everything's going to be peachy keen. That's no guarantee everything's going to be fine. Even in healthy 
family relationships. Children still rebel sometimes. I mean, have you ever read Genesis? God, the perfect parent, does everything right. And what happens? His kids still rebel. Even in healthy families, discipline is not always easy. It's not always welcomed. Discipline is the love no one wants. I guess we shouldn't be all that surprised that our children struggle so much with it because the truth is, most of us adults struggle with discipline too. Amen? Most of us adults struggle with discipline too. We don't like discipline either. We don't like it when God, our heavenly parent, our heavenly father, says no when we really want him to say yes. We don't like it when he says, you must do this, when frankly we'd rather not do whatever it is. We don't like the rules that God has for us any more than our children like the rules that we give them. And God has plenty of rules, doesn't he? Read the Bible. Pray all the time. Love your enemies. Honor your mother and father. Forgive one another. Honor your wedding vows. Be generous to those in need. Serve one another in love. Look after widows and orphans. Keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Do not love money or material things. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't live for yourself. Live for God. These are just some of the rules. And as God gives out rule after rule, it's easy for us to begin to feel tied down and restricted. Just like being strapped in a car seat. We can't go where we want to go doesn't always feel comfortable. We can't do what we want to do. And just like Lauren at three years old, we stomp our little feet and we look up to God and say, I wish I had a different daddy. You ever feel like that? Does being a Christian ever feel like a terrible burden to you? Boy, it would be a whole lot easy, easier if I didn't have to worry with all this stuff. If I could just live the life that I want to live. If I could just do things the way I think they ought to be done. Are you ever tempted to rebel against God? Used to, it was more common for, pe common for people to just blatantly rebel against God and they knew they were rebelling against God. Nowadays, it's kind of changed to where instead of overtly rebelling against God, what we do is we just change our definition of God. We just redefine God in a way so that now we have a God that lines up with the way we think things should be and how we want to live. And all that is really is idolatry. It's creating our own gods. And so then we just cruise down the path and we can feel all fine, all at peace with our God. But are we at peace with the one true God? You ever tempted to rebel against God? Listen, in light of what we were talking about earlier, if you're tempted to rebel against God, and sometimes I am, if you're tempted to rebel against Him, what is the quality of your relationship with Him? Remember, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. So what's the quality of your relationship with God? What's the quality of my relationship with God? It really comes down to this. Are you convinced that he loves you? That he really does love you? Do you remember how he's blessed you? Do you remember how he gave Jesus, his only son, to die for you? Do you remember how the scriptures tell us about the powerful glorious eternal future that God wants for you and for me see whenever we're tempted to rebel against God or tempted to try and recreate God or Jesus in our own image 
What it really comes down to is we don't trust that God really is good. We don't trust that he really does have our best interests in mind. We don't trust his love. We discipline our children because we love them, right? Can we accept that God's discipline is because of his love for us? He's just loving us. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, that's page 852 in the Bible's in the pews. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 5. This is kind of picking it up in the middle of his flow of thought, but we had to begin somewhere here. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 5, we read this. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? This was obviously written a long time ago, right? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who who have been trained by it. We have something we'd like you to see. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, His craftsmanship, His masterpiece. Can we say that together, what they were just saying there? Can you say your name and then say, Is God's original masterpiece. Would you join me in that? Kevin is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And God wants to keep working in you and working in me till we reflect the image of his son more and more and more. And sometimes, guys, it's going to hurt. That's the way discipline works. But it's part of the process. What does God want for you? He wants healing. He wants wholeness. He wants to set us free from the sin that has deformed his image in us. He wants us to conform to the image of his son. But the only way for that healing and wholeness and transformation to take place is through us submitting to God's discipline. Are you willing to obey the God who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for your sins and my sins? Are you willing to pray that scary yet foundational prayer? God, I welcome you to do whatever you want in my life, even if it hurts. I welcome you to do whatever you want to do in me, even if it hurts. And the only way that we can pray that prayer and mean it is if we choose to trust in his love for us. 
look, God's a lot smarter than we are. He knows more than we do. And there's going to be times when he's going to do things and he's going to allow things that don't make sense to us. He's going to do things, he's going to allow things that we don't like. But at the bottom of it, at the deepest part, when you, when you peel all the different layers of rationalizations down to the, the, the bare fabric, what we're going to find is, do we trust his love or not? Are you and I willing to say, Lord, I trust you. I choose to trust that when you say you love me, you mean it. Are you willing to choose to trust him? Everyone please stand. I'm going to ask the musicians to take their places.